Hello everyone, my name is Minko Gechev. I am working on Angular at Google. Today I would want to share with you a couple of insights on how you can optimize your application's runtime performance. First, we're going to look into how to diagnose a few common performance problems by using Chrome DevTools. I'll explain what flame charts are and how we can use them to find performance pitfalls. As a next step, we're going to discuss how to optimize our apps and make them faster. Finally, we're going to look into the JavaScript virtual machine runtime and explore how it could impact our app's performance. I've been doing a lot of work in this space over the past couple of years. Often at events or on the internet, folks ask me, how can I make my application run faster? Well, the high level answer to this question is pretty simple. Just do less. This advice is valid not only in the context of Angular, but for any framework or programming language out there. To make our apps run faster, we should just do fewer things. At NGConf 2018, I gave the talk Optimizing an Angular Application, where I explained several practices that can make Angular do less, improving our app's performance. Things haven't changed much over the past few years, and these practices are still valid. In fact, I would recommend you watching this video to get more value out of this current one. We can memoize calculations using pure pipes or storing the results out of calculations. We can skip change detection using on push or running code outside of the Angular zone. And clearly we can render fewer components using virtual scrolling or pagination. In this video, we're going to classify common performance problems into several categories, learn how to recognize them using the Chrome DevTools profiler, and apply these practices that we already know to speed up our apps. Let us first look into how we can profile an application. For the video, I have built this dashboard. Here we have a few different charts, a widget showing an overall score for the data we have, a table, and at the bottom, just a bunch of links. To profile this app, we need to keep in mind the following three essential preconditions. When building the project, we need to ensure the CLI is using its production environment. Running a production build is required because otherwise, the CLI will not remove code that Angular uses only during development to guard us against common mistakes, such as circular bindings, for example. Next, we need to make sure we're not mangling the output of the CLI. This precondition is not as critical as the first one, but ensuring we have readable methods and property names will help us identify the cause of issues we find. Finally, we need to make sure we're profiling the app without any browser extensions enabled. Extensions can add extra noise to the profiler and even skew the results if they plug into the app's execution lifecycle. The easiest way to do this is to open an app in the incognito mode. All right, now let me prepare our dashboard for debugging, making sure it follows these three preconditions. We can make sure we disable mangling by setting the ng-build mango environment variable to false. After that, we need to invoke ng-build with dash dash prot to build the app in the production environment. Look at this beautiful output from the Angular CLI here. Notice we are exceeding the maximum bundle budget here. That is because we are using strict mode. So we have lower threshold and we also disabled mangling. So our bundles will be larger because of that. Disabling mangling can negatively impact the profiler's output because the JavaScript virtual machine needs to parse more code, but it shouldn't skew the metrics dramatically. Next, we can go to the disk directory and start a static file server. I really love using surf since it is aware of the client-side routing and when it starts a server, it automatically puts the URL of the app into the clipboard. Now to preview the app, we can open an incognito Chrome window and paste the URL in the address bar. 
To profile the application, first go to the Performance tab and after that click on the Record button. We can start interacting with the app to capture application usage scenarios in the profiler. Once we are ready, we can stop the profiling and preview the flame chart. Here it is necessary to notice that Chrome DevTools shows us the estimated frame rate over time. See how where the rate is lower, there is a red line on top. DevTools follows the rail model. It indicates risks that the frame rate drops to a level that would not allow the UI to respond within 50 milliseconds to user interaction. As a next step, let us look at what flame graphs are and how can we read them. Here is an example of a flame graph. It visualizes the execution of a program over some time. Each rectangle size is proportional to the number of times the corresponding call ended up being part of the call stack during the profiler sampling. Brandon Gregg, a performance engineer at Netflix, originally developed this visualization method of profiler's output. All right, so now let us trace the execution of a program and sample it to preview it with flame graph to get a better understanding of this visualization. Here we have a few functions. A, which calls B and A1. B, which does some work and right after that calls D. D, which calls E and the function A1 and E. We first call the function A and right after that we call A1. At the beginning, we'll first call the function A. When the profiler takes a sample, it will find A in the call stack and record this fact. After that, it will call B. We'll have A and B onto the call stack in the next sample. Continuing, we'll get A, B, and D, and at the following sample, D will invoke E. Once the execution completes, we'll get E, D, and B out of the call stack, and we're going to invoke A1. At the next sample, we'll have completed A, and the profiler will capture A1 onto the call stack. The primary purpose of the flame graphs is to capture how many samples a given function occurred in. Since this could potentially be in a multi-threaded environment, the order of execution is not something that we can express accurately with just a single graph. To improve the visualization, we can sort the samples in alphabetical order and merge the rectangles corresponding to a specific function call into one. We can see that we spent a decent amount of time in B, so there might be a place for optimization here. Well, enough about flame graphs. Now let us talk about flame charts, which is something different. When the Chrome DevTools team worked on their profiler, they decided to reuse the flame graph visualization because they found it particularly useful. However, since their main focus was the main JavaScript thread, they changed the format a little bit to show also the execution over time. Let us look into the flame chart from the profiling we did just a few minutes ago. Notice the calls from the Angular runtime. For example, refresh component, refresh view, etc. At the bottom, we can find the execution of the component's template function. When we select this call, drag the bottom bar up, and here we can see a link to the template's function exact location within the formatted source file. Clicking on it will take us directly to the right spot. Here we can find all the IB instruction rendering this template. Clicking on the bottom up tab, we can preview all the functions, the template function code, and see how much time we spent in them, which corresponds to the number of samples the profiler captured them in. Now let us use this knowledge to understand what triggers the change detection and find redundant calls. Based on the many apps I've profiled, some of the most frequent redundant change detection triggers come from set timeout, set interval, and request animation frame. Often, these calls are in third-party libraries, so it is not immediately apparent that uh, they occurred. Well, notice at the bottom here, before we even get into the Angular runtime, there is a rectangle that says event click. This event is what triggered this cycle of change detection. 
the event maps directly to our click on the hamburger menu toggling the site navigation. Scrolling down, we can see the detect changes call that will later indirectly evoke the component's template functions. Zooming out, however, notice that we have many similar change detection calls, many more than the clicks with it. Zooming in, we can see a timer event. Judging based on the equal intervals we run change detection in here, this seems like a leaked set interval. If this behavior was not intended, we can just wrap the invocation inside of ng-zone, run outside Angular, just to remove redundant change detection calls and optimize our app. Okay, well, as a next step, let us look into how we can detect long calls. Long calls could be particularly harmful to our application's performance, especially if there are in templates or lifecycle hooks that Angular invokes during change detection. Going back to the flame chart, we can see that we have a getter called aggregate at the bottom of one of the calls. Clicking on the bottom of tab, we can find this piece of code's exact location in the source tab. To see if we're spending sufficient time in the aggregate getter as part of the change detection, we can just go back to the top of the flame chart, click on any of the calls there, and just explore the bottom-up tab again. Here we can see that we have spent over 50% of the execution time only in the aggregate getter. Well, that is a lot of time. Here we have a couple of options in order to optimize the code. Clearly, we can use memoization, for example. Since the call occurs in the template, we can even use a pure pipe. All of these approaches are definitely valid. At the same time, however, the call seems to be quite expensive. So even if we apply memoization or pure pipes, we'll still have to perform the calculation at least once, which will hurt the initial performance and initial rendering of our app. What we could do instead is move the calculation into a web worker. Let us go to the terminal and just run ngg web worker specifying the worker's name. Now open the worker file and let us replace its content. Here I'm using a snippet, but let me quickly go through the code. We declared a message listener and in the callback we get a message ID and an array over which we're going to perform the calculation. We use ID just to ensure we return the result associated with a correct worker message. At the bottom of the function, we just pull the result back, associating it with the message ID we received earlier. To use the worker, I'm going to create a very simple service. This way, we can quickly mock it and cache different calls. Here, we first instantiate the worker, after that, add an event listener to process the response with the calculated result. And at the bottom, we send a message to the worker before that, ensuring that there are no other pending calls. Finally, we can just update the getter to reuse the service which communicates with the worker. First, we're going to inject it into the constructor of the home component. After that, we will invoke its calculate method, passing the required parameters. If we get a number, we're just going to return it. Alternatively, we want to return the string calculating, since, well, this is an asynchronous calculation. Here we rely on the fact that Angular will call its change detection when the microtask queue of the browser is empty. This way, the aggregate getter will return the numeric value at the last change detection call, and we're going to just make sure that we have consistent state of the view this way. We can now preview the result. Notice that we get the calculating label for a bet until it changes to the calls result in just a few milliseconds. Let us now look into the final pattern that we're going to describe in today's video. In this scenario, we have a really large component tree with many cheap calculations. For example, very simple templates and lifecycle hooks without any heavy calculations. Here is one such flame chart we can see that there is still a frame drop that can impact the user experience. But most calls here are taking less than one millisecond, so what could we do? 
When Angular calls the app's change detection, it will start from the parent component and check its children after that. It is also essential to notice that depending on the change detection strategy, components using onPush could be cheaper than others. Having a parent component with many children using onPush could be relatively cheap, as soon as change in the children's inputs doesn't trigger change detection. In contrast, however, if many children are using the default change detection strategy, the execution could be much slower. A refactoring could be used here to improve the performance, you're just creating a new parent component that uses onPush and move as many of the components using the default change detection strategy as its children. This way, we're going to prevent change detection running in entire component subtrees and have faster execution since we're going to do less. However, keep in mind that this could bring improvements during change detection, but not necessary at initial rendering. Angular will still have to render all the components, and the more components we have, well, the slower the rendering would be. The way to fix this is to render fewer components. Virtual scrolling is a way to achieve this. If we have thousands of items in a list, virtual scrolling could help us render fewer components. Pagination is clearly another alternative. A more advanced strategy is implementing on-demand rendering, depending on what is currently visible in the viewport. For the purpose, we can use the Intersection Observer API. Well, the chances are that you would be able to speed up your application's runtime performance if you're following all the practices that we already mentioned. Especially during initial rendering, however, there are occasions when the JavaScript virtual machine runtime could bring some extra weight and make things more difficult. Instead of interpreting all the source code we provide, the JavaScript virtual machine compiles it to native code to improve performance. This technique is known as just-in-time compilation, or JIT. Often JIT relies on assumptions about the source code, and when these assumptions turn out to be incorrect, the VM needs to de-optimize the source code. Well, we have optimized the internals of Angular well for such situations. But JIT on its own can bring extra cost during execution, especially for cold code that hasn't been compiled yet. Well, now let us visualize this in practice. To do that, we need to enable an experimental setting in Chrome DevTools. Go to the gear icon, select Experiments, and enable Timeline, V8, Runtime Call Stats on Timeline. Enabling the setting will require a restart of DevTools. Now, when we go to Performance and Profile the app, we're going to see something interesting. Let us zoom in in the first part of the timeline. When we magnify further, we're going to see many compile and parse calls in the flame chart. These are all places where a JavaScript VM compiles code. During code execution until JIT happens, some functions could take 5x or even 10x the time they will take once the JavaScript virtual machine compiles them. We can see that when we move towards the end of the timeline. Notice how we have almost zero compile calls and all the functions are taking much shorter. Here is one compile call later on because the JavaScript virtual machine performs JIT on demand. This function hasn't been called in the past, so we just need to compile it right here. Well, that was pretty much everything I had for today. I hope this presentation clarifies what's happening under the hood of your app's runtime and how you can diagnose typical performance issues. We explained three main patterns, identifying redundant change detection triggers, detecting and optimizing expensive calls using web workers, and refactoring applications with large component hierarchies. In the end, we peeked into JavaScript virtual machine runtime and saw how function calls could be way more expensive before a JavaScript virtual machine compiles them. Thank you very much for watching this video. See you next time and happy coding!